Okay, well I'm with Kevin Weiss, who's a primary foods packaging technologist and uh, the packaging innovation lead for Marks and Spencers, um, who are one of the best known, but apparently the smallest food retailer on the high street in the UK. But you said an interesting thing this morning, Kevin. You said your customer base expects Marks and Spencers to do the right thing. Now, um, clearly that smacks of environmentalism, sustainability. Where does sustainability in terms of your plastics packaging fit into plan A? Um, some years ago we took the decision to try and eliminate all materials that we couldn't recycle. So we have uh, majored on polymers, particularly on major polymers that can be recycled. Even if the recycling facility isn't up to speed, we know that where they are we can do something with it. So we, we are, I think, 95% now on materials within our business that are recyclable. And that's mostly um, RPT, I would guess, yeah. Our pet, PET, um, and polypropylenes now, um, and also, of course, cardboard, a major part of our business, and template. Okay, so that's very consistent with um, some of the views you've been evincing and a lot of the, del a lot of the speakers have been uh, proposing about the circular economy. Um, so a recycled uh, polymer fits into that. Where do you see biodegradables in that scenario? We feel that biodegradables are a little hint back to the old linear economy. Um, you make it, you sequester energy in it, and then you throw it away and it disappears. It's the same, it's the same philosophy as linear. Um, there are some applications where it is very useful, maybe on lightweight materials that can't be recovered mechanically or chemically. So where they would actually end up in the environment, it's maybe better to use biodegradables there, but actually design it out at the first place. So a reused uh, material is probably more important uh, than, than, its, than its genesis, is that right? Yeah, we, a material has inherently, we think, have a reusable quality about it, yeah. Do you have any milestones for biopolymer adoption? Um, we haven't. We have one big project on at the moment which we hope would come to fruition before this conference, but uh, we are seriously looking at biopolymers um, as, as replacements for swap outs for. There was something in your presentation that struck me particularly, and you, you put forward a, a kind of tripartite approach to packaging, and you talked of a more or less a hybrid between um, hydrocarbons, bio, and waste, um, with, the, with the balances fluctuating because of price or whatever. Do you see that as a, as a, as a, a more sort of um, level playing field approach to this whole issue? I think it, the reason we've kind of developed that model is that it, it accommodates um, where we are now and where we want to be much more quickly. I think if you try and do a massive swap out all in one go, unless you're the size of Coca-Cola, it's almost impossible to do. I think you have to be sensible. Hydrocarbons are very, very useful materials, but actually let's not use too many of them if we've got alternatives. And use waste, of course. Do you think outside of this room we should actually be drawing the distinction between the genesis of a material? Does it, does it really matter? I don't think it matters to the consumer. Mm. Um, it might matter to the business where we're getting the materials from mm. and the uh, security and integrity of the stock. Mm. Uh, we, know, we think we know the petrochemical industry very well. Mm. Um, we, we need to be very, very much more aware of what, where these materials come from. So we're not cutting down rainforest to make biopolymer, for instance. Well, if you'll excuse probably a, a slightly philosophical question, but where does the consumer fit in the circular economy scenario? Are they actually player in this. Yes, absolutely. To bring materials back into the loop. That's, they're the consumer. They're the people who turn it from a useful material into a waste. To bring That's materials it. back, but I don't suppose it really matters to the consumer. And do you think they can draw the distinction between um, a different type of material? I'm, I'm not sure they can even tell the difference between PET and PP. No, they can't. And, and, and we shouldn't even begin to start educating them because if we do, we're going to be actually going off down the wrong road. Let us do the right thing and let them trust us to do that. And if there is information they're interested in, as, as the guy from IKEA said, go on the website, find out. Uh, but actually, it should be the best thing to do. Mm. That's, that's the objective. And last question, um, and just do you see energy from waste incineration as part of a circular economy? It is a use, um, or do you see it as very linear? I think it's better to burn than bury. That's, mm. And if we've, we're in the transition period where we can't use 100% of the materials we, uh, we want to recycle, then actually let's get some energy back, let's get that sequestered carbon back. Mm. Putting it in the ground is just lost.
That's very good, thank you. Oh, well, just one last question. You're taking a lead on all of this. Where are the other retailers in the UK? Are they following? Uh, they tend to. We have a very good collaboration on uh, this, the Black Sea Pet project. Uh, most of the retailers are talking to each other around that one. Mm -hmm. So there is hint that there is shared knowledge and shared interest because to get the scale, to make this happen, you need all of us on board. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, thank you.